Good evening, and thank you all for joining us. I'm Megan Overby with the Red River Farm Network, and I will be facilitating this virtual edition of the 2020 North Dakota Stockman's Association Spring Roundup. While COVID-19 may have interfered with the association's ability to physically come together this month, it will not stand in the way of engaging with their members. So the North Dakota Stockman's Association is dedicated to uniting, protecting and promoting, educating and serving the state's beef cattle industry. Tonight's agenda is jam packed. We have a lot of good presentations put together for you. We'll hear some association news from President Dan Rorvig and Executive Vice President Julie Ellingson. We'll have an update on cattle prices and livestock markets. Learn more about the recently passed Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, or CFAP. And finally, hear about land access policy. So just a few housekeeping items before we get to our presenters. This meeting, again, is being facilitated by the Red River Farm Network and recognizes that the North Dakota Stockman's Association as the host. All participant microphones should be muted and to submit a question at any time during the presentations. We will answer questions at the end, but you can uh, either hit the chat box that's found somewhere on your screen and ask a question that way. We will collect those questions. Otherwise, feel free to email questions to Don, D-O-N, at R R. FN is in Nancy.com. Again, Don at RRFN.com. And of course, this roundup is being recorded so we can share it with those who are unable to attend at a later point. So without further ado, let's get to our first speaker of the night, North Dakota Stockman's Association President Dan Rorvig from Macville. The association is proud of its roots in volunteer leadership, and one of those leaders is indeed Association President Dan Rorvig, who manages a cow-calf herd, backgrounds yearlings, and develops bred heifers on his ranch near Macville with his wife, Teresa, and daughter, Amy. Here's to, he's here tonight to share some of those highlights. And Dan, the floor is yours now. I will unmute you and switch it to your screen. Megan, thank you very much. Did I make the trip over? On behalf of your North Dakota Stockman's Associations, its staff, its and its directors, I'd like to welcome you to the very first ever virtual edition of our Spring Roundups. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dan Rorvig. As, as Megan said, we ranch in Macville, North Dakota, down along the Cheyenne River. We're grateful to be here. We're grateful for the help by the Red River Farm Network, and we're also grateful for your your folks' patience as we uh, as we go through our first ever virtual spring roundup. I want to thank our good friends at the Red River Farm Network that with their help with this project. Again, we're kind of in uncharted water, and I want to thank Don Wick, and I want to thank Megan Overby. I wanted to call her Turnquist, but I can't do that after her last couple of weeks. So congratulations, Megan, on your, on your wedding. And uh, thank you for your help on this project. For starters, let me say I'm disappointed that we weren't able to meet with you folks face to face as we would in our normal spring roundups. We scheduled meetings in each of our six districts scattered around the state. And I was really looking forward to seeing your local communities and, and maybe seeing some of the local color that uh, each of our little communities has. While originally planned for six locations scattered all the way from Wild Rose to Havana, the COVID-19 epidemic made us kind of readjust our plans. We hope you'll humor us as we kind of slug our way through this uncharted water of this virtual presentation. Please be patient and a bit benevolent as we spend the next bit of time with you this evening. We'd like to visit with you just as we would face-to-face -face about topics of interest in our association and our industry. You know, it'd be pretty easy to paint uh, 2019 and 2020 with kind of a, kind of a gray, uh, somber color, but, but I don't intend to do that. We will, however, visit about events of the year and what we expect to see down the road. For starters, we can visit about the COVID-19 pandemic. 
uh, and how it affected our industry and the, and the efforts that your association has taken. As we discuss the care packages, the care uh, financial package and the coronavirus food assistance program called CFAP, uh, it's brought to our attention that there was $5.1 billion set aside for the cattlemen in this country. Your association uh, set up a 12 member task force to work on the formation, administration and disbursement of these funds. Our input was gathered and and put together with input from many other state cattle organizations, from many national cattlemen's associations, from commodity groups and governmental groups. Terms were negotiated and, and discussed and the program was rolled out through the FSA office. Many of you have probably already gone through the process and probably re received some of the financial aid that, that came through that program. As the program progressed, you know, we stumbled across some inequities that were uncovered. I'd suggest that each one of you stay tuned to this situation over the course of the this summer as, as uh, there could be possibility of, of changes or modifications to this program. Another project that we're pretty proud of is uh, was our recipe program. Those of you who follow our Facebook program are uh, get to see those home recipes that are submitted by our members. And you know they're brought to us at a time when there would there got to be a lot more at home cooking than we're probably used to. So I hope you were all able to enjoy some of those. As the COVID nineteen situation went on, because of economic injury to families, supply chain interruptions, and the escalating retail beef prices, we could see that some of our neighbors needed some help. Working with the Great Plains Food Bank we were able to sponsor a $20,000 gift of beef provided by our North Dakota ranchers and, and focused that, eff that effort to our rural communities. We coined this project Beef Relief. Again, we'd like to thank the Great Plains Food Bank for letting us help with that effort. Much, very much of our time and efforts have been focused on the cattle market situation. This started in the fall with the, with the packing plant fires in Kansas and the price chaos and market disruptions were only added to by the COVID-19 situation. In this current time of large meat supplies and a relatively small number of commercial packers serving our industry, cattle producers up and down the food chain were dealt a nasty blow financially. As consumers stayed home, the dynamics of the restaurant and the grocery store trade were completely changed. Supply processes were disrupted. Prices to consumers skyrocketed and prices to producers plummeted. Our group, along with others, has called on a, for an investigation into some of these packers and their practices. This was brought forward to the USDA and Secretary Purdue, along with the Department of Justice. While right today, we don't necessarily know the exact status or, or the details of this investigation, we do know that it is progressing. And I guess we'll wait for the outcome and, and see how the events shake out. Price discovery, of course, has become a more important discussion. Your association has spent countless hours studying and discussing the very many different price discovery proposals. I want you to know that we will continue to do so as to tell you the truth, there are no easy answers. Also, I would challenge each one of you to do the same. Educate yourselves. At our October annual convention, I would like input from each of you. I'd like some very, very grassroots driven policy and direction regarding price discovery. I do want you to know this, that at this time, your association has policy on the books supporting free enterprise and additional price discovery. So please make every effort that you can to get to Bismarck October 8th through 10th for our annual convention to be part of this discussion. Also this fall, the process of mandatory price reporting will, will be discussed for renewal at the federal level. Again, a very important topic in the price discovery process for our industry. I also want to take this chance to say 
Uh, I'm going to change the subject just a bit, but I would like to take this opportunity to say a very big thank you to the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame for honoring our North Dakota Stockman's Association with their Special Achievement Award for 2020. This is a great honor for our association. The two associations, North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame and the North Dakota Stockman's Association, share many members, we share many traditions, and many ideals. So again, I say a big thank you to the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame. With that, I'd like to say it's an honor being your current president of your association. We're very proud of our 91-year-old organization that the, and the efforts that we make daily to promote and help our industry. Your membership, your input, and your opinion are very important and very respected. And remember this, when in doubt, close the gate. Megan, thank you. Thank you for your help this evening and thank you for all you folks who are participating and, and listening and presenting. So uh, we're looking forward to a fun evening. Well, Dan, thank you so much for that message. And again, Dan will stick around for the entire presentation. So if you have a question for him, but uh, don't want to forget it, you can type it in the chat box now or e'll email it to don at rrfn.com. Uh, and we will get that question answered at the end of this uh, presentation period. So thank you, Dan. I'll put you on mute here again, real quick, like. There we go. All right, and next I will introduce our next panelist. Here with us tonight is Dr. Tim Petrie, the livestock economist for North Dakota State University Extension. Tim was raised on a ranch in northwestern North Dakota. He's a member, was a member rather, of the teaching research staff in the Department of Agricultural Economics for 30 years and then joined over to NDSU Extension as a livestock marketing economist. He travels extensively conducting meetings on livestock marketing educational topics and writes a monthly column on current livestock marketing issues. Welcome, Tim. Well, thanks a lot, Megan, and good afternoon, everybody. Just a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to need to probably try to share my screen. You don't have to look at my face anyway and, and get that out of the way, and then we'll go on with the presentation. Let me try to do that. Looks like we're working, so uh, yes, I can see it, Tim. So go right okay. ahead. Okay, are we all go? Okay, well, yeah. Again, good evening, everybody. I certainly wish uh, we were here under better circumstances and having a stake and so on, and I could see you socially. But these are unprecedented times, and like the other said, we're uh, going to do this a new way and see how it happens. Uh, the you know. Unprecedented times is, is probably a light statement compared to what it really is. You know, we've got an unprecedented world pandemic, unprecedented world economic collapse into recession, unprecedented social unrest. And uh, one of those alone would lead to extreme uncertainty and volatility, you know, put them all together pales in comparison to any other black swan that event that the cattle industry has ever faced. You know, I've been around a while, as Megan said, and, you know, like 9-11, BSE, the recent Tyson fire that was just uh, uh, talked about, uh, you know, pale in comparison to this. So I am a little bit long-winded and have several sites so we need to get along here. But anyway, uh, you see my website there, and again, this is recorded. You can just Google Livestock Economics. I'm going to show you a number of slides. And, and we update these slides periodically, at least once a month or more often, depends on. So uh, if you want to see one of these slides in the future, just help yourself to that. So I'm going to start off with the uh, January 1st cattle inventory. And again, this is no news to most of you. You're aware of it. And, and in fact, USDA will be doing another survey on July 1st. So you may be getting a questionnaire on that. That's much less 
less extensive than the January 1st. So that's why we use January 1st. This gives us state by state information. So I thought this would be just a starting point of where we've been, where we're you know, at now and some of the things affecting the market and ahead. So just starting at the right hand of the chart there, you see that uh, beef cow numbers did peak out cyclically in 2018. And during uh, last year, 2019, we declined about 374,000 head after that 31.7 million peak there on January 1st, 19. And so on January 1st, 2020, we had 31.3 million beef cows. If we go back to the middle of the chart there and you see 2010, that's right uh, where we were back then and probably where we could have should and could have been throughout the entire time period where we see that big V there because we'd already uh, declined the cow herd uh, four straight years, which would be a normal liquidation phase and prices were high enough in 2010 that we should have stopped liquidation. But we had a very terrible drought in the Southern Plains and uh, lost uh, 2.4 million beef cows uh, down into 2014. And so that's one of the reasons why we had the very high prices in 2014 is because of that uh, dr drastic due to unprecedented uh, circumstances and instead of a, uh, 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 you know, that instead of a pandemic was a drought. But then uh, we turned around and had the biggest accumulation phase in history and increased about 2.7 million head and again peaked out and we're on the downward side. So uh, the, the, that we peaked out and came down a little bit was uh, good news. At least it was price supportive and, and we'd have fewer calves this fall. And however, as Dan has mentioned, we were still expecting record beef production this year. We had record beef production in 2019. We're expecting it again because uh, of the big cow herd that we had there in 2019 and the leftover cattle there. So uh, that was a headwind to prices. So uh, I know most of you probably are interested in what calf prices are gonna be this fall and you see my big red question mark this year and uh, certainly a lot of questions there, and more questions and answers, but let's just kind of take a look at uh, where we've been. We started the red line is where we've been this year on North Dakota 550 to six weight uh, steer calves. The green line uh, was last year. I like to put the last three years on a chart because if it happened the last three years, it could happen again, particularly under normal circumstances. But if you go to the left hand side of the chart, you see how close the red and green line were there paralleling each other. And then you also see that the last three years we hit 180 in April and we were certainly going to do that again this year, if not better. And we already were at a 177 there by the end of February, but then as was mentioned before, COVID-19 hit and prices plummeted and, and, and so on. But uh, interestingly enough, just uh, uh, a week before last, we were back to a little bit above where we were last year and last week uh, close to the same, which I think is certainly a feat given all the problems we've had. And I know uh, you weren't happy with the prices last year, but uh, we weren't in, affected by this pandemic and so on. So to be at about the same level, I think was, was you know, is important thing. I'm going to show you the reasons why that happened in, in a minute, but you know, let's go to the fall, a big question mark there. Who knows what's going to happen with the pandemic and so on and very difficult to predict. I'm just going to throw out for some reasons I'll talk about in a minute or so. Let's for planning purposes do $10 under last year to at least to start with and then you know they could be quite a bit better than that and they could be uh, worse than that if if the pandemic gets worse and so on and we don't know what's happening with exports and so on but we were looking for a year at least up to 2000 the blue line 2018 or maybe even up to 2017 so certainly that's behind us uh, so you know I, I used this slide back when I was giving talks 
And uh, as Megan said, I, I did travel extensively, I think is what you should have said, because I don't travel extensively now because I, I can't. But anyway, for all, I did a lot of traveling this spring and this is a slide I was using except for the starred coronavirus in there. And these are all issues that seemed very, very important to us and could affect the market. And you know, we're starting right off there. As I said before, we had record beef production, but we also have record pork, uh, uh, chicken and total meat production to deal with, but we were expecting record exports. We'd satisfied with trade agreements with our major beef customers, starting with Korea and then Japan and, and Mexico and Canada. So that was all positive, plus a phase one with China. And, and so, uh, you know, you see corn Corn prices, they're usually for feeder cattle. Corn prices are the biggest thing that we talk about for fall, affecting fall prices. And now that, you know, nobody's hardly even mentioning that. And uh, African swine fever was expected to, you know, uh, cause a big deficit in protein, in particular in Southeast Asia. So that was favorable. But then the coronavirus hit. And so uh, a lot of problems there. So the two biggest things that affect fall calf prices are corn prices and fed cattle prices. So let's take a look at both, starting with corn prices. And uh, again, uh, you know, uh, my counterpart, Frayne Olson, is responsible for talking about corn prices, and I often kid with him, you just tell me what fall corn prices are going to be, and I'll tell you exactly what feeder cattle prices are going to be, and that kind of would have been the same case, except now the pandemic has uh, raised havoc with that. But on, the, you know, corn prices... Uh, were also affected by the coronavirus. As you can see there, going back to March, they were the right on average and the same as they were last year, and they went down, which obviously is not good news for corn producers or those that have corn to sell or even harvesting corn now. But that is the reason or one of the reasons why we had as good a calf prices this had just a couple of weeks ago, similar to last year, is because of low corn prices also affected the heavier weights that we will uh, talk about in a, in a minute. So, um, you know, uh, right now USDA is predicting a record, uh, you know, almost 16 billion bushel corn crop. And so uh, that in itself is positive to prices and uh, and but again that's far from being in the bin just like uh, last year and so we'll have to wait and see there and then the bottom chart is just uh, December corn futures uh, you know paralleling maybe fall calf prices and you know uh, uh, again the They've fallen quite a bit, and today they're closed about, I think, down about five cents again today at, at 336. So that's, uh, from a feeder cattle standpoint, is positive, certainly not positive for our friends, the corn growers. The other part of the equation that is slaughter steer prices, and then again, a lot of what's happened to them was mes mentioned with the, uh, you know, retail demand and packing plants closed and so on like the calf prices we started off the year to th the the goal line is 2019 started off right on 2019 we did see a little bit more weakness before the pandemic got the worst because we had a lot of fed cattle to get through and there were some heavy weights and then COVID hit and then they plummeted all over the place down below 100 and then picked up for a while as as packing plant capacity came down but now has fallen with a big backlog of cattle we have in beef production that I'll talk about in a minute. So the square red dots there are the futures and so you know the, you know there is a, a, a strong basis there right now. Last week uh, we were at 101 on fed cattle and you know today we were down there at at uh, you know, at 93.52, I think the market closed down. So the futures market is pessimistic and going on into the fall, uh, you know, when we expected prices would be above a little bit last year, if everything came together right with exports and the trade agreement and, and uh, so on. Now we're quite a bit below, you know, October last year, we were at 110 on the cash market and now we're uh, futures today, October futures right at 100. So we're down 10 
ten dollars and on the December last year, cash market 122 and futures day 104. So we're down about $18 on the D's futures. So that's the reason, even though we've got, uh, you know, a kind of a favorable corn prices, fed cattle prices as of now. And yeah, I realize the futures market, uh, you know, does, uh, take some risk there and and we could be much different than that like i said on calf prices by the time fall gets here but you know they could be better too if everything comes together so you know again it's just uncertainly and we got and we got to wait and see go to the heavier weight uh, yearling type of cattle where we have a futures market that again might give us some comparison to think of what calf prices could be in the fall. Red line again is this year and starting off on the left hand side of the chart again we were just identical to what we were the last couple years and following the the uh, green line of 2019 there until the pandemic hit and we expected to follow that line green line and probably even be better in the fall actually back in february uh the fall futures were up at 150 to 155 and uh, of course then covid set in and and we plummeted down but again uh last week uh about 135 on on these 800 pound yearlings and and uh, you know compared to 139 last year so only four dollar difference but again i think the big thing there was corn go to the fall futures and are trading up there at 133 in september up to over 136 if we go to november last year cash prices in november were 142 and uh, the futures now are at 136 so down about six dollars is what the futures saying over the cash market last year so that's why one of the reasons why i threw out maybe that ten dollar for calf prices but they could be better or they could be worse again so uh just kind of run through some things uh, you know here at the top of the cattle slaughter you see how cattle slaughter plummeted when the blue line there when packing plants closed but the good news there is uh, packing plants are operating and actually got back to better than maybe some people thought uh, with these social distancing and the, and the employee problems and so on we're just back to over 98 percent of of where we were last year at this time and just a little bit off off the peak where we were early in there. So that's good news that we are uh, killing a lot of cattle. I didn't mention on the previous slide. And so let me go back there a little, uh, a couple, uh, just a little disclaimer here. I realize that red line is, is the cash price quoted by USDA. But if you have cattle to sell and there were no bids because packing plants are closed and so on, that was relatively meaningless. And there are a, a lot of backlog cattle in that couldn't get uh, bid so I am uh, well aware of that and I just wanted to, to mention that as well so go to the bottom slide our beef production is even back above what it was last year and it was a all at the beginning of the year again that's that record beef production that we predicted and one of the reasons why we have higher beef production but a little bit lower slaughter is because of our steer dressed weights that are so much higher than uh, last year and um, you know uh, last week uh, we averaged 892 pounds on steers compared to 846 up almost 50 pounds, 46 pounds over a year ago. So that shows the backlog of cattle that we're still working through. And one of the reasons why fed cattle prices are going down and likely going to be down again this week. And also exemplifying that is the chart on the bottom, the cattle on feed report came out last Friday and, uh, and showing that we've got uh, over 900,000 more cattle on feed over 120 days. So again, that's a major obstacle on fed cattle prices and one of the reasons that, that they're being uh, uh, pressured there. And so, um, hate to end on some bad news, but again, I know that you uh, ranchers out west are suffering with dry conditions and up where I'm from, the, uh, originally it's the same thing. and and um, 
And also it's even drier to the south in cattle country. You see the drought monitor there on the left hand side. And on the right hand side is a chart that sometimes you don't see, but USDA puts out the dark green is where the beef cows are and then the red is where drought. And, you know, it is only in North Dakota we've got approximately 23% of beef cows was now in a drought area so that's concerning for prices and will there be early movement of cattle and you know obviously no, no good management strategies during a drought they're all bad you just gotta uh, you know kind of pick the one that's the least worst or whatever grammatically is is correct or so and you know really a double-edged sword this year when we're fighting COVID and then if we have to draw uh, fight drought too it just will create a, a, a mammoth headache there so uh, let's hope for at least in western North Dakota let's hope for rain I also realize this is some of you down in south central and even up into northeastern North Dakota have too much and even still trouble combining and so on so we see a, a big uh, paradox there even in North Dakota from too wet to too dry so uh, just end up with cow prices then uh, which are about the same right now as they were last year and again a wide range in cow prices but this is just an average of, of a lean cow price that USDA quotes none for North Dakota but Montana and South Dakota so you know if you have to start moving some cows uh, that uh, due to drought that are, are open or whatever you know at least right now cow prices are similar to last year. So I think with that, uh, you know, I'm going to quit, see if there, uh, I need to move along to other speakers. I really enjoyed the invite and again, wish there were better things that we could talk about, but uh, hang in there and, you know, I'll probably always say this, but let's look to the future. Those um, fundamentals that were so good at the beginning of the year will come back eventually when we get this COVID out of the way. So Megan, Let's uh, stop there and turn it over to the next speaker. Yes, very good. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tim Petrie. Again, if somebody has a question for uh, either of our presenters that have presented thus far, type that into the chat box right now or send your email to don, D-O-N, at R-R-F-N is in Nancy, dot com. And without any further ado, on to our next presenter for the night. We have Brad Tickison, who was appointed by the Trump administration to serve as the State Executive Director of the North Dakota USDA Farm Service Agency back in November 2017. Tickison is a lifelong resident of Steele County, where he grew up on the family farm. A farmer himself, Tickison, has held agricultural leadership roles on both the state and national levels. Welcome, Brad. Uh, we'll get your screen shared here and get your audio unmuted, and we'll hear what you have to share with us. All right, Brad. There we go. There. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. And then Wanda, can you hit the share screen uh, button at the bottom? Well, thanks everyone for inviting FSA into this meeting. Um, it's kind of a time of need where, you know, Stockman's is probably relying on FSA more than they want to, I think. And that, and that's something that uh, you probably don't, aren't used to, or that you're not something, uh, that cattlemen are very comfortable with or that we have to do. So I'm not seeing the screen share. I think what we're gonna do here is that Wanda and I were gonna do it kind of as a tag team, kind of like wrestling a crap calf at branding. So I'm scared that either I dropped the hoof or she let the calf get away and we got a good old fashioned wreck going on here. But if we don't get the screen share up, I can kind of touch base with it, but. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Is there a green share screen uh, button at the bottom of your panel, Wanda? Uh, actually, no. Somehow I minim minimized you, so I'm just trying to figure out how to get you back. That's okay. Are you in a full screen mode right now? I am not. Okay. I know that's one. Um, and then your view. Are you in gallery view or uh, I think it's presenter view or slide view? Otherwise, what I can do is I do believe, um, Brad, I have your uh, 
your presentation saved on my desktop here. Maybe I can quickly see if I can pull that up. I apologize. Right. That's okay. Let me go. All right. Here we go. Brad, can you see my screen? Yep, I can see PowerPoint loading, so I assume there we go. All right. There we go. That's why we always have All a right. backup plan. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess uh, you'll just cue me when I can go to the next slide yeah. and we'll go from there. Yeah, well, getting back to just uh, thanks for having us on, Julie, and the Sockmans as, as far as that goes. Uh, like I said before, it's probably not the, uh, the, the best association. No, I mean, I shouldn't say best, but I mean, it's one of those deals where the cattlemen is probably not participate in FSA as much as they have this year and will as the, as the time goes on here. So we want to make sure that you got good information, that we give you some direction, and that we uh, uh, are available to answer any questions and help us help us all through this uh, un, unprecedented times, like Dr. Petrie said. So, but uh, next slide. So, like Dr. Petrie said, that uh, we are experiencing a drought in the western half of the state, and we are still trying to get uh, corn harvested and, and trying to manage preventive plant acres now, probably in the eastern side of the state. Uh, we are very aware of the drought and we'll be monitoring this and, uh, as time goes on. And you can see by the map there that we are in a D1 status on, on some of it. And once we get to a D2 status, that we will start the time clicking for an L, L or a livestock forage program payment that uh, unfortunately, especially at, back in 2017, that we used a lot of that. And so uh, as far as moving forward, we'll just wait and see how Mother Nature treats us and, uh, and make sure that we don't let that slip through the cracks and, and make sure your county extension agent is uh, putting in good data because they're a great resource in order to monitor the conditions in each individual county. Next slide, maybe. So uh, what the big buzzword right now in uh, FSA is CFAP, you know, Corona Food Virus Assistance Program, as you see there, and that was announced back after Memorial Day here on May 23rd, and it runs through August 28th. So we still have a lot of time for this program to be administered. Uh, currently, North Dakota, as of 618 or last week, that we have paid out over $65 million under CFAP. And this program is right now about a 50 50 between non specialty crops or, yeah, non specialty crops and uh, cattle or livestock. And so the livestock. Like I think Dan alluded to earlier, that you know livestock was definitely a big recipient of the of the legislation that was passed, and that we're moving forward to that nationwide. We've uh, administered over three billion or close to three billion dollars of this uh, CFAP dollars that have gone out, and uh, we have a long ways to go for the 16 billion. So I th still think there's still a lot of uh, participants that have to come in and sign up and I still think that there's still a lot of money to be doled out because the idea of this program was to st keep the economy stimulated and make sure that uh, producers and livestock and cat grain farmers weren't hurt by the coronavirus impact on, on the marketplace or whatever. The other programs that we have, livestock forage program, I alluded to that, that will be hinged on the disaster and the livestock indemnity program and I want to uh, address this a little bit and apologize. As you know, in FSA that we have a lot of programs going on right now. More, many of the career people that work with FSA have probably never seen anything like this. I'm kind of a short timer and you know temporary there, but uh, we have just a ton of programs. We have staff that doesn't know which way to turn sometimes. And some of these programs, and I'll take uh, ownership for that, we have backburnered some of these things because of the lack of deadlines or because of other things that have popped up. I will say that we are trying to move them front and center. I mean, we do not want any of these programs to uh, get you know, dismissed because of lack of importance. We know that they're very important to all the producers and that we need to keep uh, moving forward and, and picking and choosing our priorities and making sure that money gets into these hands of producers. And as ELAP program, emergency 
livestock assistance program and of course it's for the honeybees and also it says there you know the farm raised fish but a lot of the elap can also help supplement some feed supplements if you have to move some hay in and move that crp haying and grazing right now we have no, no notice on that this or i mean that excuse me on the emergency part but crp haying and grazing for those that have that uh crp contracts you know those are ongoing the, the grazing crp and and also haying every you know rotation years that also helps as far as our hay stocks go and then crp emergency haying and grazing i would assume that with the drought index you know if it keeps getting uh, more intense that we will see some direction on that as time matures here so next slide megan So if, if you can uh, see on the CFAP, getting back to that, being it's a new program and for producers that have never participated in FSA before, that you know, the best thing you can do is uh, go to farmers.gov and get on that website and you can see backslash CFAP. And once you get on that website and click on that, it's very simple to go through uh, as the far as the process. And on that website, there is a calculator. So you're able to go through and actually I would suggest go to the calculator. It's an Excel spreadsheet form. Some of our computers that we own on the farm maybe don't have the most updated Excel, but it does work with most of them. You will have to enable editing in order to get into that, but it's going to ask you for your name, your county, or it starts with your state, your county, and then your name, and plug all those things into the worksheet, because once you get those numbers into the worksheet, you're able to, on your left-hand side of your, of your computer screen, be able to merge all that onto the application. So typing it in just once, you're able to play around with the numbers on the worksheet and, and get those numbers in there. And then when you're ready, you can merge that right over the application. So all that information transfers very simple, or very effortlessly or whatever. So the calculator will give you an approximate uh, value of what you are to receive. This program right now is, is val or, uh, administered at an 80% fund level. I think they were very concerned with the participation being high, that there wasn't enough money. So if if the money doesn't all go out the door and there is still uh, some money left, that that 80%, I would assume, gets moved to 100%. Uh, in that calculator, uh, it will ask you to self-certify your numbers, that we are asking producers to do the best that you can to have those numbers. It's I to make an analogy to filling out your taxes that we all have to do our taxes at the end of the year and we sign our tax return and we give that to the irs this is kind of the same principle that once you get that form filled out and that we uh, submit our form to the fsa office whether it's by mail whether it's walking in now today as appointment we'll talk about that in a little bit that you can take and um, uh, get this process going just through your self-certifying of the numbers I just want to caution everybody that, you know, in a year or once this program matures past its deadline, that we will go through our random spot checks and you will have to quantify those numbers if you get spot checked. Next slide, David. And as you can see, there's other information as far as uh, the coronavirus thing. The best thing that, you know, we have going for us now is our local service centers. Uh, we can get one more slide there. David. And here they are across the state of North Dakota. The heavier dots, of course, that's the part where we have a farm loan presence, but uh, every, uh, all counties, except for uh, the two outside slope and billings are, have their own office and that we are able to now, being removed into phase two, that we are able to see customers by appointments. I wanna thank all the producers for uh, being patient during this time. You know, we have been trying to uh, be self, uh, or uh, social distancing ourselves and making sure that we are treating our employees with the utmost concern and, and respect that we do not want them. And I'm glad to say that we have nobody that has been tested positive or does have the coronavirus in the state that we know of. And so we've kept our employees safe and we wanna keep doing that. So that's one reason why we did limit the, limit the offices to staff or to just two. And then phase one, we we're able to bring in up to 10 people and now we've just started phase two where we can have customers come in by appointment. But all these county offices have email addresses and uh, we'll, next slide, Megan. And yeah, we'll get into the email. And then the other thing to be in touch with your county office is to get onto the text messaging and the email uh, list or whatever that we, 
We'll send out text messages specific to your area, to your county. We won't <clears throat> do it generally that the county office can do this. And it's very, very important, say if they open up emergency hang or whatever, that you'd receive a text count, text message saying that in uh, Stark County that emergency hang will be opened up on August 1st or whatever. And that would be very advantageous to you. And the other thing that we're learning with the text messaging, it reminds people of deadlines, of certifying deadlines. And then with those smartphones, like you see right there too, is uh, we're able to actually start moving into signing some government forms and uh, inquire at your local office about that. This technology thing is happening faster than most of us and can put our hand around, but the good part about it, it makes everything available to us, whether we have the doors open or closed, and it's very, very handy for all producers. Last slide, I think. As you can see there, we have the North Dakota you know, Farm Aid. My name's Brad Tickerson, and we have state committee members listed there, uh, state office staff, uh, like, it, uh, like Megan said, this will be recorded and you can go through that, but uh, we're all reachable and we'll all find out the answer to your question. It's probably not always the right answer that you wanna hear. I mean, but we can find out an answer. So that it doesn't hurt to ask and it doesn't hurt to get educated. And we're here to make sure that all these as much uh, help during these tough times as, as with them. So I think that just about wraps it up if I remember the slide presentation and we'll look for questions and uh, and have that uh, at the end of the, of the thing. So thanks again, Megan. Thanks, Julie and Stockman's. Uh, like Kim said, I still kind of salivating that, uh, that steak. I know I was in Maddock and I was up in Leeds the last two years and they were all good times and it was always fun to uh, rub elbows with the cattlemen and and uh, and enjoy a good good night of socializing. But uh, we'll get back there. Uh, this this will come and pass, and we'll get back there. So thanks, Megan. Yes, thank you, Brad, as always. And uh, producers, if you do have a question on that new CFAP program, haven't done your sign up yet, now's the perfect time to ask it. Be sure to type your question into the chat box or email it to don at rrfn.com. Next is North Dakota Stockman's Association Executive Vice President Julie Ellingson of St. Anthony. Julie is another leader who works to protect, promote, educate, and serve North Dakota's beef industry. In addition to managing the staff and financial aspects of the association, Julie serves as the association's chief spokesperson and lobbyist. She and her husband, Chad, ranch near St. Anthony. Julie. Thanks, Megan, and good evening, everyone. We sure appreciate you joining us on our maiden voyage. As Brad just alluded to, and, and Dan as well, we really look forward to getting back um, to that face-to-face -face opportunities and, and are crossing our fingers that our annual convention will certainly provide that. But in the meantime, um, we're, we're glad to be able to tap into this technology and to share some information and, and even more importantly, hear back from you about feedback and, and what your questions are. Uh, the purpose of my of my remarks is really to talk about kind of next phase with uh, the CFAP program. I appreciate the explanation um, uh, that that Brad had given about what the existing framework is, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the uh, implications that and uh, advice that the association had provided, and some of the the next steps of looking at what the the program is that may light, uh, lie ahead. Dan talked a little bit about um, the, the development of the association's foundational principles. Um, of course, we knew that there was a, a pot of funds that were set aside for direct assistance for livestock producers. And because we don't often um, have programs of this nature, there's not a program to pull off the shelf and, and to revise. Uh, it was important that we thought through some of those concepts and, and tried to provide some advice to the congressional delegation and USDA um, as they help develop that program. And so I wanna give a special shout out to a special task force that was appointed by um, our association to really roll up their sleeves and dive into that, to create some ideas to, for a pragmatic approach um, that would address issues within North Dakota, um, all our livestock sectors that were represented here with the resources uh, that are available. Uh, proud of, of the effort and the work that they had done. Unfortunately, not a lot of that work was reflected in, in the final plan. And there are some, well, we're grateful for the support, 
um, there are some, some significant gaps in our view. Um, and I know that, that I've heard from many of you about areas of how that impl uh, impacts your own individual um, operation. And so um, we are rolling up our sleeves and continuing to work on opportunities for some supplementary packages to address some of those areas of shortfall. As we heard from, from many of you, and it was as alluded to, that one of the primary concerns about the existing CFAP program for North Dakota producers has been the real stark, bright line, deadline dates um, that uh, differentiate between either program eligibility or um, payment rates uh, between those, those deadline dates. And so heard a lot about that of how, for instance, um, a steer that would be sold on February 14th, for instance, um, could capture a payment um, up to $214, but just a couple of days later, same animal, um, because of that bright line date, um, would only qualify for um, the, the $33 inventory payment. Similar with um, feeder cattle, all the different cattle class classes, as well as um, calves that are born after the, the May 14th cutoff date. Uh, Tim talked about one of the concerns that we heard a lot about as well, uh, fed cattle ready to go, um, not because they weren't um, trying to sell, but because there was uh, no bids, also fell outside that window um, and were subjected to a considerably lower rate. And so those are some of the areas of focus that we would like to fortify that second tier payments um, in the existing CFAP to make them more comparable, equitable, with those that are available right now under the existing framework for that January 15th through um, April, April date, and some uh, a, really a focus of, of what we've been working on. Some of you will remember that in the middle of May, um, House passed what they called the, the HEROES Act. That was somewhere in the, the middle of the month. Um, that was the, the multi-trillion dollar bill um, that was focused on next step COVID um, stimulus and relief type packages, along with a, a whole host of other issues. As, as you well know, there's, um, because it contains so many things, I believe it's 1800 pages or so, um, there's a lot of different issues and of course a significant debate about many of those components. The, the agricultural components, however, um, less controversial and have really have some solid ideas that I think that hopefully we can retain and build upon um, as that package or something similar um, is discussed on, in the other chamber and hopefully can get something across the finish line. In that HEROES Act, and again, that was passed in the House, it has not been taken up yet by this, the Senate, um, and so there's much work left to do. But in that House package in the HEROES Act, it did include um, expanded payments, those um, second tier payments, um, to levels comparable to the first tier. Um, that would take those payments and then move the, the date um, to June 30th as compared to the earlier date that the existing program is under. And so that's one positive component of it. Um, that's been an emphasis um, that it's been adopted by our, our board um, at the advice and recommendations of our special task force to work towards, um, again, extending those, those payments so there's more equity included, as well as uh, looking at those that calf date born um, so that the same $33 payment would be extended to those calves born after that date. So we don't have that bright line difference. One of the other recommendations that have come from our board of directors is also to push back on any proposals that would incentivize prolonging the backlog um, of market ready cattle. Um, Tim talked about the, the implications that could mean and concerned about what, set, what a program of that nature would mean for cow-calf producers looking to sell um, feeder cattle this fall, as well as our North Dakota feeders and long-term implications. And it's important, we think, is to, to deal with that backlog, um, get that pain behind us, and get more on more of a regular role and keep our cattle um, current. And so those are some of the concepts that we will be working towards in next step legislation. Uh, visiting with the congressional delegation and some of our other national industry leaders, um, it appears that that um, second phase COVID relief could come in one of two packages or two, two different avenues. Either the traditional uh, appropriations process, but more likely um, uh, COVID specific legislation such as the HEROES Act or something more. 
Now, that being said, that does not mean that's going to happen overnight and at the discussion. They are scheduled, they mean Congress, scheduled to um, recess for the 4th of July holiday and then not come back to work um, in DC until the fourth week in July. So a lot of work that would have to be done. And so best case scenario would be the end of July or into August before language um, would be worked on and, and finalized under that vehicle. Um, something that we have certainly worked uh, almost on a daily basis with our congressional delegation about these areas of concern. You know, USDA gave us a window into what their general thought process was before they even had finalized the details of the CFAP program. And so we already started um, discussing what some potential shortfalls might be and uh, identifying um, how the program would apply to, to North Dakota cattle operations. And so I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we have a congressional delegation that understands the concern um, and is committed to working with us to hopefully fortify um, that package and, and help our producers um, become more whole in that process with that as assistance program. And of course, um, Senator Hoven being the, the chair of the Senate Ag Approps Committee, she has a pivotal role that should be helpful. To a couple of other things, um, the, the HEROES Act that I had mentioned, again, passed in the House, not, not across the finish line in the Senate. It contained a couple of other provisions that are of significance to North Dakota livestock producers that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. And hopefully we're able either to retain those in a COVID package or in other legislation. One of those is um, the, the Cover Crop Flexibility Act. And I know we looked at the drought monitor map today and we have wide disparities from one end of the state to the other. Many of our eastern producers were still struggling with the super saturated conditions and have what? an incredible amount of prevent plant issues. This is particularly important as it was last year um, with those conditions. Many of you will remember that last year um, RMA granted a, a one time change in the date uh, allowing for haying and grazing or chopping of cover crops earlier um, the normal date, November 1st, moved it back to September 1st, which was useful to many North Dakota producers, um, not only in um, utilizing or make, uh, freeing up some available forage and addressing some of those issues, but also helping utilize some of that extra moisture um, to help manage the precipitation challenges. That, what happened last year was, was a one-time thing. Um, so we have asked for that policy change. We think it has a lot of merit to be a, a forever change. And that would be reflected in this Cover Crop Flexibility Act um, champion and, and the co -spot, or lead sponsor would be Senator Thun, again, with support from our delegation as well. That was an element that was included in that HEROES Act and something that we have been strongly pushing for. As you look at the calendar and planting dates have passed, and, uh, it's, it's important that we get some certainty right now. And so, um, addressing this from the permanent avenue, but we're also looking for a maybe quicker, um, more expeditious type of decision. So we're also requesting this, this one time um, request too. So the temporary change as well as the permanent change. And I'm grateful for the North Dakota congressional team who on our ask um, joined with other Midwestern uh, lawmakers in sending a letter to Secretary Purdue re requesting that change. So two different ways of approaching that topic. Hopefully we can help um, bring some relief to our producers suffering with that particular challenge. That was Act again, another component that was included in it and we think has merit. Um, a bill that's referred to as the Sale Act. Um, this would establish the a Livestock Dealers Trust, um, essentially giving unpaid sellers of livestock first priority in cases of livestock dealer defaults. Uh, the Livestock Marketing Association has, has led the effort on this. I mean, it seemed that Larry Schnell, who's the new national president, which we we'll congratulate him on, um, really has helped champion and bring this issue to light. It's something that you as Stockman's Association members endorsed a couple of years ago at our convention. Again, providing more support for those unpaid livestock sellers, whether they be producers or auction markets, and to improve upon the current system which often delivers only pennies on the dollar back in those unfortunate situations. We think it has a lot of merit. It was included in that House, uh, House bill 
And either in that form, um, through the Senate or through some other avenue, we hope to bring across the finish line. So there's a lot of work to be done. I'm encouraged by the fact that the House soundly supported those agricultural elements in that broader bill. And I think we can make a strong case to the Senate to help retain those. It doesn't mean it's going to be all easy and it's going to be a, anything, any guarantees that come along with it. But I want you to know that it is important to us we have heard from many, many, many of you about the significance of making some of those adjustments, and we are committed to working hard to deliver some relief for you in that fashion. I will close my um, remarks right now by, by encouraging too, like, like FSA with some new technologies to continue a, a more immediate communication flow. The Stockman's Association is working hard to try to deliver you real-time information also. If you are a Stockman's Association member, you enjoy your monthly copy of your North Dakota Stockman magazine, which is a primary communication source. But we realize things are moving fast, uh, slow and fast, right? The world's slowed down, but that doesn't mean that the decisions we have to make and the information that we need to know about has been moving lickety split. For that reason, we have really amped up our efforts to communicate real-time info to our members through our online sources um, via email. If you are a Stockman's member, we, we need to have your email though in order to get that to you. And many membership records do not include them. So give that, if you are a member, make sure you pass that information back to us and we can do the best job of getting you that information more quickly. Again, I will turn it back to you, Megan, but thanks so much to everybody for your support of the Stockman's Association for taking part tonight. And please let us know how we can um, better serve you and continue to support you in your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And of course, if you have any question for Julie, submit that now in the chat box or email to dawn at rrfn.com. We will get those answered uh, once we get done with our last presenter, which is Senator Dale Patton, a member of the legislature's interim natural resources committee Dale is a Stockman's Association member from Watford City. He was a strong advocate for the Stockman's Association's initiated property rights legislation and has helped provide a landowner perspective on a resulting land access study that is evaluating the pros and cons of an electronic posting application, which is being piloted this year. He is here tonight to talk about that effort together with Brian Hosek of the Game and Fish Department. They'll give you a look at how the application works. So I know I do believe, Brian, you have the screen and uh, Dale, you're going to talk a little. So we'll get uh, you guys unmute, unmuted and Brian, if you can share your screen, that would be great. Can you hear me? Yes, and I can see your screen as well. And Dale, I, I do believe I unmuted you as well. So take yes. the stage, gentlemen. <laughs> uh, thank you, Megan, uh, Julie, Dan, everybody. Glad to be here uh, uh, with the uh, virtual uh, spring roundup. Uh, I wanted to add a little bit to the history of the Stockman's Association before we get into our presentation. Uh, Dan mentioned that it's the 91st year of it. Actually, the first meeting was held on June 6th, uh, 1929 in Watford City. So our, our, the roots are Watford City, right? Uh, yeah, for the Stockman's Association. Uh, the meeting was called by Andrew Johnstone and the first president that was elected was, was John Leakey. So uh, a little bit of background. I like to do a little history once in a while. Uh, the, the last legislative session was extremely interesting when it came to landowner rights. Uh, we uh, Bob Early was championed and, uh, and I co-sponsored a bill to try to get a, uh, a posting bill uh, passed. I think Julie, it's, I don't remember if it's been six or seven or eight legislative sessions that the association has been a, a, an advocate of getting something passed where uh, the land was closed to, to hunting unless permission was granted. Um, we had several different drafts of the bill. It was Senate Bill 2315. We actually did get it passed through the Senate and uh, it got hung up over in the House and it went down to, I don't remember if it was the 
day before or the second to last day or something like that. And it failed in the House by just a very few votes. Um, I would put it, if not the most controversial bill in the session, probably in the top three or five. Um, I know that I had probably somewhere in the range between five and 600 emails on it, all the way from Alberta to Florida uh, and many different perspectives. And some of them were actually not very polite even, if you can imagine. So with the uh, Senate Bill 2315 failing on the House side, uh, there was a backup bill that we had, House Bill 1021, which essentially created a study of land access. And part of that component was to establish an electronic posting pilot project, um, which authorized uh, the Interim Natural Resource Committee to uh, select three counties, and we did this on a first come, first volunteer basis. Uh, and we ended up with uh, Ramsey County, down where Devil's Lake is, uh, Richland County down by Wapton, and then Slope County where a Amadon is the county seat. So those are the three counties. And uh, met several times to try to iron out the technical aspects of it. And we're gonna show you very shortly uh, what that would looks like. Uh, the electronic posting is going to be hosted uh, on the Game and Fish website. Um, you'll have to be a North Dakota resident to use it. So if you're an out-of-state landowner, uh, you will have to have somebody within the state that you authorize either a tenant or something like that to be able to use the system. Um, there was a lot of options that we could do when we looked at how we were going to set this up. And ultimately, we went and decided, let's do the simplest possible way and, uh, and have some success with that. And if we're satisfied with that and, uh, and it's successful and we're actually able to get legislation passed, then at that point, we can probably do some enhancements to the system. But we didn't want to have anything that would blow up uh, during this pilot study, uh, if at all possible, that would result in, in uh, not, us not being able to propose a bill in the next session. So again, we kept it simple. Uh, the information on it is based on county uh, the, the, the landowner information is based on county tax records. So uh, we picked three counties, uh, one in the West that had a very low population, uh, then Ramsey, uh, you know, an ag hunt, uh, you know, a lot of ag uh, and cattle, and then Richland County. Those were, uh, McKenzie County was fourth, but we'd only had three that were authorized. But uh, the other thing to re remember is with, this is a pilot project. So if uh, people in those three counties sign up, there is no enforcement based on the electronic posting. It's just a pilot project and uh, it's an ability for the landowners to practice on it and ability for the hunters to experience it. So there is, uh, you, you can't go and call the game warden and say that somebody's hunting on my land and I post it electronically. Uh, if you only post electronically, it's like it's not posted. Um, Side comment, a physical posting will always be dominant and probably will be for any new future legislation that we do. Even if you don't post electronically, you can post physically. And even if you do electronically, the physical posting, what you have on that is the dominant and would probably continue to be the dominant posting mechanism of, of the other kinds. Uh, the pilot county landowners, uh, tenants, have until July 15th to designate their land as posted. So what, what Brian is gonna show you shortly that it's open right now and available. And uh, then we will close that on July 15th. So with that, Brian, would you pull up your screen please? And uh, I'll have him walk through just how simple it is uh, to get your land posted. Okay, good, good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay on that? Yes. All right. My name is Brian Hosick. I'm with Administrative Services at Game and Fish. Um, I'm going to attempt to do a, a live demo here. I don't have a presentation, but we're, we're going to try to uh, navigate the, the, the site where this is available. So this is available at the Game and Fish website at gf.nd.gov. 
Um, I know everyone else tonight had a had a COVID slide, and so we we have definitely kind of done our best to keep this uh, study on pace and and leverage the the use of the Game and Fish uh, online licensing system to to evaluate the study. So um, the good news with this is that those that have ever ever had a history of uh, purchasing a hunting or fishing license or registering a boat. Um, they would be pretty familiar with this. I'm just going to briefly explain that for those that may not as well too. Um, this is the main landing page of the Game and Fish website. Um, in the upper right corner here, we have a, play, a link called My Account. And this link will, when you click on this link, it'll take you to a, another page to ask you for your first name, last name, date of birth. It's just an authentication measure. Again, those who have done this before have seen this and they get into their profile. For a for a uh, a new individual here, um, if you haven't if you've never uh, conducted business with Game and Fish before, you you provide additional information with address, uh, phone number, and and uh, some information like that to create a profile. Um, I have a few tabs here. Jump back to this one. We do have some demo data here, so I'm going to log in. I'm actually going to log in as an individual here, a, a test account. Um, we do have uh, Scott Arandek has been uh, nice enough to let us demo his data for him. So give me a second to log in. Okay, so this particular account here, we have authenticated and made it to the main page of the account profile for the Game and Fish Online Services. Much of this information at the top is for licenses, lotteries, as I mentioned, watercraft. And towards the bottom of this section here is a piece called land parcels. On this section, there's a, when you click this search land parcels, what we're basically doing is, is searching the county data, the county tax data. So all this data heavily relies upon that information. And we have some recent copies for the, for the three uh, pilot counties in here. Um, at this point, we're going to associate some lands and search the system for for uh, data in one of those three counties. So the first piece you would select is the, the county of your choice, and then you have to provide one of the additional pieces of information, either the name on the tax bill, a parcel ID, or even a section township range. If you have several parcels, the name on the tax bill will retrieve them all at one time. And so let me take a snapshot there. and. That's, again, it's important as the information is entered exactly on the tax bill to retrieve that information. So again, we're using Scott's information for the demo here. When you search that information, you can see the, the parcels that were returned. We have a, a parcel in section seven, uh, one in 25 and two in 26. And so this piece of the application we're, we're, we're really, or the, the guidelines are really following here, mimic much of what's done on the physical posting requirements today. And so it's not only eligible for landowners, but other tenants or operators, uh, or all, anyone authorized to post this land can also do this. Um, at this point here, we're going to select those. So if perhaps if it was, you know, in this, in this demo, perhaps if uh, I was renting um, a couple parcels here from Scott, um, I could pick the ones that I wanted to post or I'm authorized to post. I'm going to associate with those with my profile, hit continue. I'm going to decide that I would like to post those lands. And if I would like, I can, I can add any additional information. If, if I would like to publish my point of contact, whether it be a phone number or email, I can click these check boxes or there's an alternate point of contact, for example. So if Scott were uh, posting his own lands and would like to provide alternate contact information, um, he can do so in these particular boxes here. By clicking submit, you're certifying that you're authorized and we have now associated those parcels on that profile of that account I used here. So it be the, it more or less would be the same process if you have um, land under different ownerships or land in different counties to go search uh, and associate those particular parcels, but they are now posted and you can come back in and edit this information if there were some changes you need to make. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're trying to push, push this out to July 15th, uh, mostly to be used for some of the mapping pieces that would be available um, 
to those on the other side using this information. Um, I think with, uh, again, with that, uh, that profile that you come in, you log in with, uh, new users would just enter their information and provide that initial, initial account. But again, those that are, that are familiar with this or have conducted business in this platform in the past, it's, uh, it's more or less navigating to the bottom, selecting the parcels and, and um, applying those with that profile. To view some of this information, um, we do have on the Game and Fish website, there's a section out here for mapping. And under this map section, there's a map service applications. We, uh, we do have some, a, a few different varieties of map service applications, just plots, guide viewer, fishing waters, and general info. We are posting this information. Um, it is all dynamic. It's available right now through this particular viewer. Um, when you open that application up, it brings up a statewide map here. And as you zoom into different portions of the county, um, we can see some of those particular parcels that were just posted. So in Slope County here, all the little orange crosshatch areas are, are lands that were posted electronically. There's ways to identify, there's tools on the site to identify some of that information. Um, by clicking on the particular parcel. Let's see if I can click that here. And I can see that, that this particular parcel was uh, owned by this individual and has been posted by um, this individual. So again, all this is dynamic. Um, it's driven, this is a, uh, driven through the online licensing system at Game and Fish. Um, available right now, you can go out to gf.nd.gov and click on my account to get directly in there. And, and um, in addition to that, there's some other things with, uh, with some frequently asked questions we've made available on our site. And if there are any questions, uh, they can certainly be submitted to ndgf at nd.gov. Um, we're hoping to get some more information in here, uh, really, really find out about the usability of this. Um, how easy it was to, to post electronically, the usability of that application um, to get some, some more feedback and information uh, in the future with some survey information that we plan to send out. So uh, with that, I guess uh, I can pass that back on to, to Dale or Megan. Um, and uh, yeah, certainly take a peek and explore if you wanna um, evaluate, evaluate the electronic posting system here. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Yeah. A few other comments, uh, if you want to stick around, Brian, for just a yes. second. Uh, the, the maps will be printable. So if somebody plans on going hunting in Slope County, for example, uh, they can go in and pull that and print the map up and take it with them. And also will be available uh, on a mobile uh, app, correct, Brian? That'd be able to use on, on your phone? Yes, we, uh, we will. That's with that cutoff. We, we do an annual plots guide publication that many are familiar with. Um, it has a bunch of... Uh, state and federal lands um, and a guide that we've done that people pit, people typically uh, are made available at many different stores and we send many of these out. But um, yeah, those are a snapshot in time with this. And so that again, those we plan to start building that after the 15th. And then we will also have, um, we're going to try to get this information out to other, other vendors that would like to um, use this on any mobile apps for a phone. Um, a lot of these applications here that we just demoed here on the Game and Fish website, they are available through a browser, um, which does require you to be online. Um, but there's also applications out there that work offline that uh, perhaps could be used in the future for um, displaying this type of information. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Uh, with that, I, I, uh, there's a whole bunch more stuff that took place, uh, but this was uh, the meat of, of what we were looking at doing. And uh, like I said, uh, it's very simple. Uh, upgrade options that we could look at down the road might mean that you could post uh, specific dates, you could post for a specific species and open for others. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that we had a very functional system that people could operate easily before we went uh, those directions. So uh, this is what we're looking at doing. And uh, hopefully uh, by the time the session starts, we'll have enough information. They're gonna be tracking all the, uh, the access and so forth. 
and uh, getting feedback. And uh, we'll be able to come up with a bill that we could get passed. So I guess that's it for us. Very good, Will. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Brian. And we have had several questions that have come in. And so now we will transition to questions. We've saved about this last 15 minutes or so for questions. So um, I've, I've organized them out between my Don and myself for our presenters. And so if we can try to keep responses brief, uh, about a couple minutes or so for each response, that way we can get through all the questions that have been submitted. So. The first question is for Dr. Petrie. Uh, a question is, what are your thoughts on how many cattle are not fed at this time and how many cattle, and rather how that may affect the cattle market? Yeah, okay, that's a very good question. And uh, approximately 900,000 have been on feed for over 150 days. So certainly they're nearing, and even though we are back to levels of last year one of the problems we face is steer slaughter uh, you know goes up in may and peaks in june and is high in july and august unlike the hog industry where their slaughter goes down in the summer so it's easier to catch up and more difficult for us to catch up because our peak slaughter is now and in the months ahead so it's going to take a while to get through and, and not sure exactly how many but there's you know a, a, like I said, 900,000 approximately been on feed for over 150 days. Thank you, Dr. Petrie. Our next question is for Brad. Uh, how many, for many of our viewers, they're very diversified and WIP Plus is just as important as the CFAT program. And so what can you share with us regarding the telling or regarding WIP Plus and its status at this time? Well, thanks, Megan. And WIP Plus is an ongoing program. There still really is not a deadline on it. And like I said before, with the workload that we have at our FSA offices, uh, we've, we've been trying to prioritize what's important. You know, we went through the sign up period. Uh, of course, now we're into certification and CFAP's probably even moved up to the front line. Uh, WIP Plus also has been reassured that there is a quality factor coming down the road. And now we've not hit any timeline on that. Uh, I know that they are working on that in DC, trying to figure out how to adjust our wheat, spring wheat quality issues with the falling numbers last fall, and also with our test weight issues with the corn that was harvested and is still out there. But of course, most of that corn now is either laying flat on the ground or it has been harvested or there's very, what has been standing is limited in bushels. But WIP Plus is not forgotten. Uh, the one thing that I wanna I mention to the people that are watching is that in a lot of these counties when it was very it's a very complex program working with rma data and it hasn't transferred over as smoothly as we would like so a lot of manual uh um, entering for as far as fsa employees and then with that a lot of reviews that have to happen because of the complexity of it so it gets to a second and sometimes third party review before that producer is able to see some funds Thank you, Brad. The next couple questions are for either Dan or Julie, whoever feel mo feels most comfortable answering them. Uh, have you heard from the North Dakota congressional delegation regarding another round of coronavirus assistance and what are maybe some expectations from the association on this? I'll go ahead and take a stab and then Dan, you can add in. Um, as we talked about, um, we, we have strong support from our congressional delegation to um, look to supplement the existing CFAP program. Um, I know that they have heard from many producers and I encourage um, producers to reach out to their offices. In fact, we have um, one of the congressional member staffers with us tonight um, to talk about how um, that program imp uh, implications to your individual situation. But our, our hope is to be able to fortify um, at minimum those second tier payments um, and some of those other policy considerations. I suspect that it'll come in a special coronavirus um, legislative package that we'll see later this summer. Um, and we're hoping to get that across the, the finish line. But uh, we do have the support of, of our crew and it's now telling our story, making the case to their fellow, um, their colleagues in, in Congress so we can get something meaningful and support our producers. Dan, do you have anything to add on that? 
Otherwise, I can ask, yeah, take a Megan. stab at the next one. Yeah, Megan, I do. You know, when we started the CFAP process, you know, even in Senator Hoven's office, they're calling us and saying, hey, guys, what, what do you need out there in North Dakota to make this thing effective? And as we went through round one, uh, they were asking for that input, hence the, the special task committee that we put together. And as we move into what might or might not be round two of this, they're also asking, say, hey, guys, what are you seeing as, as this thing progresses? And is it working for you? And, and what can we do to enhance it? So, uh, yeah, we're, we hope we can get the right input to the right people. Very good. Thank you. And another one for Dan, Julie, or both parties with the COVID-19 situation is the sentiment regarding country of origin labeling changing. Well, I'll touch on that just a little bit. You know, they're, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're two unrelated matters, uh, both critical and important to our industry, but I believe they're unreport, un, unrelated matters. I would add, add Megan, so um, the country of origin labeling issue, of course, at the beginning of the year, some of the attention has, has turned a little bit, but there's been um, some efforts at the, at the state and national level to expand um, information available to kind of fortify um, labeling opportunities. And so a couple of different considerations being considered, um, again, at that national level. Uh, one, to make some revisions within um, the Food Safety Inspection Service um, to shore up um, the labels that are affixed as far as country of origin. In some cases, there is um, imported product that there's some minimal processing that is done that that's enough to trigger um, uh, uh, a USA label, if you will, um, and frustration, and, and rightfully so, uh, that, that those, uh, the, those thresholds would not necessarily meet the um, expectations of consumers or producers. And so looking at um, tightening that process up either through that effort or through um, the egg marketing service, um, pulling away some what we would consider arbitrary um, country of origin labels that are affixed because of that, um, that further fabrication and fortifying existing um, opportunities for, for labeling and for those, um, those premium products to create a, more of a differentiation. So a couple different tracks, but essentially, um, improving upon the systems in place with also um, recognizing the confines that we have to work within given the, the WTO ruling and the authorization for the tariffs um, under the, the previous um, mandatory cool program. And so I think we'll hear more about that, of course, all hands on deck for this COVID issue. And so I think more attention um, has been placed on that now. And so some of those other conversations may be uh, set aside, but um, something that we certainly will um, be involved with and, and ideas that have some merit. Thank you. Another question for Brad. Is corn silage covered under CFAP? What other feeds are or are not covered under CFAP? Yes, the answer to corn silage is covered under CFAP. Uh, that is the conversion factor of 7.9. Uh, 7.94 bushels per ton. So if the producer knows how many tonnage of silage that he has, that he can convert that over to bushels and then fill out the application for that. Uh, as far as feed barley right now is not um, part of it. Uh, I know that the Barley Association is working very hard on that. And we're also working on trying to get, uh, I think millet, we're also looking for conversion factor on that. So this is kind of an ongoing process. So uh, the, like I said, the deadline for this CFAP program is August 28th. So being able to participate up until that time is still in the producer's best interest. Thank you. Another question for Dr. Petrie. With the shutdowns and slowdowns at packing plants, how large is the current backlog in cattle and what will that mean for the markets? Yeah, okay, I covered a little bit before, but there is a big backlog. We don't know how many for sure, but, you know, maybe 900,000. And, and yeah, it is a problem, like I said before, because it, we're heading to peak steer or slaughter months. It is, whenever you have a backlog of anything or a surplus, you might call it, or more than normal, that is a 
not good for prices and not supportive for prices and we got to work through it and it's going to be uh, not a quick fix it's going to be a several month thing unfortunately and in fact we're probably going to see fed steers go down again this week and just the market knows they're there and that's one of the things that uh, Julie and Dan mentioned about, you know, we got to get through it and we don't want to prolong it any further than we have to, but uh, it's not going to be a quick fix. Thank you for Dan or Julie. With this being an election year, does that help or hurt our chance to get some of these policy issues across the finish line? That is a great. Well, I'll, I'll let you address the politics. <laughs> All right. I wish I had the magic answer. Uh, we know that um, the attention uh, in an election year certainly turns away from some of the issues at hand, and, um, just because in the, the number of legislative days. And so uh, it'll be important that we're able to, to move through these uh, quickly. And uh, that being said, there, there are some um, items that may um, be extended or, or pushed, pushed off till after the election. I, I wish I had a, a, a clearer answer for that, but we know that some of these issues and the, the, the CFAP supplementation, for instance, is top of mind right now. And there's that economic need within our industry. And so we're going to work hard to put that on the list of things that they, that they need to work, it, work toward um, be, because of the significance. That being said, there certainly will be items that will be um, kicked down the road and will be picked up only after the election, I'm sure. And Julie, uh, another question for you on a separate note uh, from a, a listener here. If prevent plan acres are released for haying again by September 1st, would there be opportunities for folks on the eastern side of the state to produce hay for the very dry areas in the west? Has RMA given you any feedback on the possibility of that being a quote unquote forever option? Yes, I, uh, that's, that's an answer I don't know for sure. Again, we're pursuing this, this issue from a couple of different avenues, both the permanent side and the kind of the, the one-time special, uh, special exception. And so that it remains to be seen, but certainly that would be helpful, right? Because we have very um, different kinds of needs from, from border to border. And I know there's a lot of folks that would love to be able to utilize that and, and to share with their neighbors, but I wish I had a clear answer. We're hopeful because we're pursuing these couple of, of, of um, options that, that might expedite some kind of decision, even if it's the short-term kind of decision that we'll know moving forward. Well, thank you. We're certainly rolling through the questions and more continue to roll in. And now a question for Senator Patton. What effect will the pilot project have on electric posting? And rather, let me rephrase that. What effect will the pilot project have on electric posting? And how will that impact future policy legislatively? Will sportsmen groups ever support a no trespass bill? Uh I'm going to address the, the sportsman's group. I, I do not believe that they will support a no trespass bill. In other words, where all the land is closed unless permission is granted. Uh, uh, Julie could probably, she's talked to them for more years than I have, but I don't believe that there is support with any of the sportsman's group for that. Um, the electronic posting aspect, if, if we're successful with this program, uh, or this pilot project and being able to have landowners comfortable and say, yes, it was easy for us to implement. The sportsman groups say um, it worked for us. Then uh, I could see the legislation coming forward in the next session that would authorize that. Uh, there are a few challenges uh, as you go forward. Uh, is the tax data submitted by all the counties in appropriate format? Uh, I think they're, they have some catch up to do in some counties. They may or may not be able to provide the the uh, the owner landowner information the way it needs to be in order to be put into the uh, database of, with game and fish. Um, I I think that this is a compromise bill that has a good chance with the future. Now, um, how many times do you bring a no trespass or no no hunting bill to the floor and get beat before it's over with. The challenge that we ran into in many aspects was there's a lot of ag producers out there, especially in the waterfall areas that did not want 
be contacted by a bunch of hunters all the time. And that's what a no, no hunting bill would have uh, triggered was they would all had to have permission. Uh, so there was a, not a unified voice coming from the egg community uh, regarding this uh, in, in many respects. There were egg uh, legislators, probably more on the house side, or I'm going to correct that, egg background legislators that were not able to support uh, the 2315 bill because of their constituents. They lived in cities now. Um, their predominant voters were, were city residents and hunters. And uh, every hunting group uh, is extremely effective and very active when it comes to this issue in lobbying. They're, they're in Bismarck during the session a lot. So I hope I answered that correctly for, for the uh, related to the question. Julie, anything to clarify or add on that? Yeah, so I would just, you know, appreciate Dale's explanation, uh, you know, from the Stockman's Association's point of view and, and many of our, um, our egg partners in this issue, which has been a, a high priority, this has always been rooted in private property rights. We just feel like there's inequities for, for landowners uh, in having to do something affirmative in order to have um, the ability to say who accesses their property and not. And so always will be um, the priority. Um, as we look at this pilot project, what we're trying to do is we, we don't know if we're going to love it, um, if it's ultimately going to be something that we support, but we do support this effort to uh, evaluate the, the pros and cons and if there's refinements and if it is um, a, a tool that will help lessen a burden and be effective for landowners. We are, we're eager to see what those results are too. One challenge that we have and we need to remember is that uh, in terms of um, posting, there's two different kinds in Century Code. There's that that's related to hunting, and there's also the criminal trespass area. And so there's some differences um, about application. This focus really is on the hunting um, element um, only. And so um, from our perspective for private property rights, we need to look big picture at what those solutions are. And so hopefully this, um, this effort gives us some, some, a better handle on what options might be and what uh, North Dakota Stockman's members want us to do moving forward. Uh, to follow up uh, with Julie's statements as well, I, and I agree, uh, the, I think it was the private property right argument was what got it through the Senate. Um, it was uh, enough, that basis was enough to convince uh, a majority of the Senate to, to vote in favor of 2315. Uh, did not work over on the House side. And when you look at the no hunting versus the no trespassing, two different parts of, of the code. Uh, no hunting is what's considered a strict liability uh, violation, meaning it doesn't matter if it's posted correctly. Um, doesn't matter what the person says. You know, they didn't mean to, you know, they didn't see it. None of those things matter. The criminal trespass, also the no hunting one, allows for game and fish to revoke licenses for a period of time for violators, that type of thing. The no trespass bill is in a different section and uh, the penalties are higher, but the ability to convict is also higher. Uh, the, the bar is higher in that area from what we've been told and understand. And also the willingness of uh, state's attorneys to charge it out is, uh, they're more willing to, to reduce it or, or waive the charges on a no trespass than they are on a, on a no hunting violation. Thank you both. And uh, we have a couple more questions to get to yet here. But first, I wanted to share this comment that came in from a 14-year-old named Chelsea Bramvold. And she said she has learned a lot from this virtual spring roundup. Chelsea said it will help her as she looks at her future in the cattle industry. It puts a smile on my face, and I hope yours too. It's great to see the next generation excited about this business. So thank you, Chelsea. Our next question for Dan or Julie is, is the Stockman's Association given up on the concept of Senate Bill 2315 or are we moving on to this electronic format? I'll address that just a little bit. Uh, you know, as we went through this process in the legislature, and we went through the, you know, the give and take and the compromise, and our compromise was this pilot program. At this point today, we want to see this pilot program go through 
and you know weigh the pros and cons and see if it's something that works uh and that was step one now down the road you know never say never we'll see how this pilot project works if it's something that works for our landowners for our private property rights people uh, we'll see if that's something that works for us uh, if not down the future down the road I, I don't know if there'll be another 2315 or not but uh, we kind of made that uh, made that uh, agreement that we would see this pilot project through this first step anyway Julie anything to add um, I, I guess I would just add is that I just want to remind people where we're asked, you know, encouraging people in the, those counties to participate to help us give uh, get some ideas about how effective or ineffective that it is, is important that they realize that it's just the study piece. And so the protections that are provided through a posted sign, if that's what the intentions are, still are important to use in the traditional fashion. Uh, law enforcement won't be able to say, oh, well, you just posted uh, electronically, at least during this period until the law would change. And so I just want to be crystal clear that it's trying it out for size, um, seeing if it, if it would work or how, what could make it better, um, but we still need to rely upon our traditional methods uh, until there's something as an affirmative change you know, through century code. All right, perfect there. <laughs> a final comment on that, if I could. Yep, uh, go ahead. If the Stockings Association decides that this does not work for them and they have a different route that they want to go, that's actually, that's where I would go. I, I mean, I'm going to support the position of the Stockings Association. Um, I think this, uh, I agree, is a, the first run at this uh, is going to be uh, telling for us uh, if we get to where we need to be or not. But uh, that'll be dependent on what the policy uh, makers at the Stockman's Association end up deciding. The challenge again, is there's a lot of ag people out there that did not support 2315. And that was an out for a lot of legislators. Thank you, Dale. And just a reminder here, we're kind of winding down this Q&A portion. If you do have a comment or question, please type that in the chat box or send an email to Don at RRFN, kind of our last call as we get down to the final questions here. Uh, again, for Dan or Julie, USDA and the Department of Justice began the investigation into the cattle markets after the Holcomb, Kansas fire. The allegations of market manipulation that came out of the COVID-19 situation have been added into this investigation. What do we see regarding the timeline for this investigation? That's a great question. Um, so just as a kind of a recap, so last year um, upon the, the Stockman's Association ask and, and others within the cattle industry, um, USDA launched an investigation that was um, conducted by its Packers and Stockyards Administration. Again, looking into if there was collusion, price fixing, um, some monkey business, if you will, happening within the, the packing sector, uh, focused really on the disparity between um, box beef prices and live cattle prices and the, and the disruption that we saw um, so vividly during those times. We were very disappointed that um, the outcome of that investigation was not completed. They had hinted that it would be done um, at the end of the year and at the end of January, so on and so forth, um, still nothing. And so USDA opted to roll this new investigation um, spawned by the, the COVID crisis into that old one. Um, simultaneously, the Department of Justice um, on the Stockman's Association ask that of attorneys generals across the, the, the country, our congressional delegation and others also launched an investigation. Um, I suspect that those efforts are merging together. Um, the, the DOJ's process is probably um, more robust, comprehensive. Um, I, I don't think it's something we're going to see real fast, though. I think we're going to have to be patient with that. And, and I do not believe, and it's just my hunch, that USDA would release the results of its study ahead of the DOJ completing its investigation, because I would, would trust there would be some, some overlap. And so 
we don't know the timeline. We're, we're grateful that they're taking it on. You know, DOJ doesn't normally say, hey, this is what we're doing and announce it to the world. But of course, a week or so ago, that was revealed um, uh, through information that subpoenas had been issued to the, the four big packers as, as well as some others. And so we know what's happening and uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, the information that it, is, uh, it results in, even though I don't think it's gonna come fast. Dan, anything to add? Well, you know, we're all aware that these these administrations and these bureaucracies are are kind of monsters. They're they're big with a lot of moving parts, uh, and and we've watched a few of these promised dates come and go. Uh, I I think it's important to you know realize that it is going to take a little bit of time, but I think it's also important for for each of us. And through whatever means we have available, whether it's through your Stockman's Association, through your legislators, is to remind them to keep the pressure on, to keep the process going, be think, because I think it is critical. Thank you. Another question for Dr. Petrie. The country is slowly starting to reopen, but restaurants are still operating at 50 to 75% capacity. What does this mean for the cattle markets? Well, just the fact that they're opening is good news, but you know, the fact that they're only at 50% or less capacity is not because you know, we have a very, very efficient system all the way through from, you know, from slaughter all the way through to distribution. But when you have this big a disruption, that really causes a problem. And, you know, I, I don't know the answer to this, but we're not likely to get back to 100% capa percent capacity on restaurants for some time. There are still people very apprehensive to go out, although we see on the news all the time that restaurants are open. So that's good news that they're opening. Uh, let's hope for the best and uh, and that the pandemic can get behind us and maybe even find a cure or something and rest restaurants can get back because we need everything that we, you know, all the markets that we can get operating because we're at record beef production and record competing meat production. So we've got a lot of meat to, to take care of and either eat it here or send it overseas. So the faster we can get back the better, but I don't have an, you know, that they're operating again is good news when they'll be back at full capacity and people that, you know, wanting to go is, is anybody's question right now. It's, it's up to people and, and we've never been through this before. Thank you. And uh, the final question that we've received on our end for the night uh, for Senator Patton, I don't know if Brian, if you have anything to add or an example from the game and fish side, but uh, how do you enforce a no trespass law if some people don't have internet access? Because we know uh, in rural parts of North Dakota, that is a reality. I, I can address that, um, Megan. Um, if we if we want to look at comparing that to lands that are currently unposted, it's still on to the still on sportsmen to go out there and ensure that that land isn't uh, posted elsewhere. Um, more or less, they have to do the same thing here. It's on them to determine that land, that land is not posted electronically. And so, if they don't have internet access to do that through an app or through some kind of uh, you know whether it be a phone or an application or computer, um, as mentioned before, there's still those printed. Uh, plots guide map sheets. So we're we, the, we still printing those map sheets that they can take with them that show those designations on which lands are posted electronically. Anything to add, uh, Dale, Julie, anybody else? Okay, or Dale, something to say? Okay, perfect. Well, perfect. Uh, we actually are pretty well within our time allotment here. And just a quick couple of announcements from the North Dakota Stockman's Association. First, regarding nominating committees. District nominating committees have been meeting via conference calls over the last month. They have considered nominees who are in good membership standing with the association. The North Dakota Stockman's Association is excited to release the names of the candidates soon. 
Elections will be held at their annual convention October 8th through the 10th at the Ramcota Hotel in Bismarck. And some other upcoming events I'd like to remind you of, uh, there's several of them. The North Dakota Feedlot Tour, the virtual edition, just like we're meeting here tonight, will debut July 9th, same time. Uh, be sure to go to their website and register for that. The All Breeds Cattle Tour is slated for October 2nd through the 3rd in the Minot area. And there, again, 91st Annual Convention and Trade Show, October 8th through the 10th in Bismarck. And tomorrow's Top Hands Beef Leadership Summit, October 22nd through the 24th in Minot. So again, thank you all so very much for joining us. A recording of this webinar will be available in the coming days. So be sure to look for that and share it with your family and friends. On behalf of the Red River Farm Network and everybody at the North Dakota Stockman's Association, I thank you so much and have a good evening.